We have Dr. Butler here today. He's our medical director, and he's going to talk to us about dementia screening in the elderly. Thank you. I don't have your bio, sorry. Sorry. So my bio that matters, so I guess I'm the Okno Medical Director, that's why I'm here. Uh, I'm an assistant clinical professor at the university. I'm with the Department of Family Medicine, and I'm a geriatrician uh, there then as well. So uh, that's about as much as the relevant bio as I see necessary. So I have no conflicts of interest. This is kind of something that's standard. They make us do it at the university. Uh, I can only find two organizations that are in any way interested in paying me uh, to do anything, and that's Oak Knoll University. So no one else has <laughs> taken up to that. Um, so uh, teaching objectives. So um, you know, I, I, I don't want to assume where anyone's at with their knowledge. So I'm going to go over things like what an ADL is, what an IADL is. Uh, talk about these things about functional domains um, and how that relates to cognition and why we assess and how we assess for these things. I'm going to talk about some of the medical screening evaluation. So uh, I might not spend too much time there. I have a number, some slides there. I might kind of skip over some of that um, a little bit. Um, the cognitive assessment tools. So those are kind of what sort of tools, if you suspect someone has a memory problem, what sort of tools do you want to think about using uh, to assess that individual? And then talk about, at the end, the risks and benefits of screening. Um, and then as we talk through all of this, uh, just keep in the back of your brains that you're going to screen each other uh, when you're done. And part of that is to learn how to give this tool and the stress of being given these tools because uh, it's, it's uh, not a benign process. All right, so start with what an instrumental activity of daily living is. Actually, I'm going to start even a little more, more basic than that. Let's talk about what an ADL is, an activity of daily living. So an activity of daily living are the things that we do for ourselves to take care of our own body. So it's things like brushing our teeth and combing our hair and getting dressed and toileting. Okay, so that's an ADL. An IADL, instrumental activity of daily living, those are the things that we need to do to be able to take care of our own house. So that's cooking and grocery shopping and driving and using the telephone, uh, medication management, financial management, those are the things we have to be able to do. And, and this is relevant because, you know, if you can't do these things, you kind of need help with things. And that, that's where all things break down. And beyond instrumental activities of daily living, there's the thing called advanced instrumental activities of daily living. And those are things like, I don't know, planning for a vacation where you've got to think, you know, months out in advance, financial planning, uh, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and so there's kind of a level above that then too. And so why does all this matter? So when is, as we're assessing someone's cognition, there are these ideas of these five domains, okay? So language, memory, executive functioning, visual, spatial skills, and attention. And we think these five things are what play into and contribute to someone's cognition. And so attention is relevant because this is what's impacted when people have like delirium or they have depression. And so attention is necessary in order to take in data and remember data. So when you're sleepy, you think, you know, you're two in the morning, you get woke up out of sleep, and you have poor attention, you can't remember anything. Um, and so it's, you know, as you think about where someone's at, um, particularly if they're delirious, uh, how can you expect them to calculate a bunch of numbers or remember a list of names? They can't, they can't pay attention to do it. So um, the way we measure these sorts of things is by things like a, what we call the serial seven. So we have someone count down from 100 uh, by seven. So 100, 93, 80, 86, and so forth. Another way is having to spell the word world backwards. So that, that's another way of assessing this. Um, and if you're worried about someone's attention, then as you're looking at dementia or, or trying to figure out if someone has dementia, you need to keep that, that in, in, in check there, in, in, in memory for yourself. So the next area uh, is, is memory. And there's different types of memory. So there's Episodic. So this is remembering like what you had for like supper last night, or uh, what you did with you know Joe over the weekend. Uh, that's uh, episodic memory. Semantic memory. That's the stuff that you know we had to memorize state capitals in school. That's those sort of things, kind of rote memory. There's procedural memory. It's like tying shoes. It's muscle memory, and then uh, working memory. So this is the stuff of 
you know, hey, can you go and, you know, when you're, you know, going to the fridge, get me milk and, and stuff that just quick in, quick out, uh, no need to really uh, keep it for any length of time. What's interesting with memory is, you know, we always think about, uh, you know, how people with memory problems, how is it impacting them? Um, and, you know, we see a big deficit in episodic memory uh, with people with memory problems. Um, many of them will maintain some of their semantic memory, particularly long-term memory. Um, procedural memory for people, particularly with Alzheimer's, procedural memory stays intact. And so that's why they deceive the heck out of you when they still drive okay, because they still remember to put the key in, you turn it like this, and you put it in reverse, and you go like this, and you go like this with the stocky thing when you're going to turn. And that stuff doesn't change. And the interesting thing is you can still teach people with Alzheimer's disease procedural memory. So they can participate with physical therapy. They can learn from these things. But they're not going to remember what you, what you told them about five minutes ago, but they can learn the procedure. So uh, as you work with them, just think about that. Uh, and the next area is language, the word formation, rhythm, verbal fluency. Um, and, and so what these are, these are things like naming, uh, how you structure a sentence, how you uh, pronounce the words and the sounds of the sentence. And then uh, verbal fluency is just uh, remembering a bunch of words of a certain category. So it might be a bunch of animals that you ask them to remember. It may be a bunch of words that begin with a particular letter. Um, and that's this idea of verbal fluency. Visual spatial, so this is how we interact with our environment. Um, and, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, knowing how to, you know, set this, this all up here. This is kind of visual spatial where you put things in relationship to others. We try to measure that uh, with having people draw, you know, interlocking pentagons, maybe drawing a, a clock or a, a 3D uh, cube. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's our way of trying to, to test for this sort of thing. And then executive function. So executive function, primarily, a lot of that lives in our, our frontal lobes. And executive function, that's what, that's what makes us high kind, of, kind of high functioning adults. It's what helps us plan, it's what helps us abstract. Um, and when that's impaired, that's the biggest you know, detriment for people living independently. Um, and so, you know, if, if people can't, so you think about what it takes to prepare a meal. So let's think about actually what it takes to like get all the way to eat a meal, like into the stomach meal. So you've got to have the idea that I'm hungry. What am I going to do about that? So you got to find food. you got to know what to do with that food, how to assemble that food, how to prepare that food, and ultimately you cook it, plate it, eat it, chew it up, and swallow it. And that's a lot of different steps. And, and you got to be able to plan that. And people, many times, if they have executive function issues, can't get past you know, step one or step two, um, let alone all the other things that go in, in, into that. So now to bring this, okay, so why do those things matter? So those are the areas of cognition. Now let's talk about when cognition goes wrong. So cognitive impairment, or MCI, or mild cognitive impairment, these are pe for people who have an issue with one of those domains, but they're still independent with their IADLs. Where you get into dementia is where people have an issue with at least two of those domains. So let's say they've got some memory problems and they've got some kind of abstraction, kind of executive function issues that then are interfering with their ADL. So now they need help with grocery shopping and they need help with driving. Now you've got someone who has dementia. So why is this a relevant topic? Well, it depends on the numbers you look at. Uh, dementia, a dementing illness, is 3 to 11 percent of people over the age of 65. If you think about mild cognitive impairment, if people make it to 80, a quarter of those individuals who are 80 or older have mild cognitive impairment. And there's risk of those people progressing to dementia. And so these people already have some memory problems. Granted, they're functioning okay, but they're at increased risk for developing full-blown dementia then. So 18.5 million Americans are expected to develop dementia by 2050, or at least that's the, that's the number of the kind of solid population is going to have it. Currently it's about a cost of a hundred billion dollars and this is very difficult to actually get our, our hands on this number because there's a lot of indirect costs. You know you think about if you had a loved one who has memory problems, the, the time away from work um, to care for that that loved one or you know whatever, all the all those indirect costs for caring for that individual. It's not just 
the hard expenses of you know someone coming to a place like Oakville. And then interestingly, up to two thirds of all dementia cases go undiagnosed. So think about the other kind of social ramifications of that. You know, someone with dementia who's out there driving and gets in an accident or what have you. Um, so uh, how, how we break down dementia? So 5.3 million. So I say Alzheimer's type dementia. That's Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So Alzheimer's type dementia is the way we really word it because it's this pattern. You really can't make Alzheimer's disease. We can really only diagnose after someone's died and we looked at the brain itself and say yes we find consistent changes in the brain of Alzheimer's so you can really only make it that so it's Alzheimer's type dementia for semantics sake I guess uh, 5.3 million uh, people have Alzheimer's type dementia that makes up 70 percent of all cases of dementia the other 30 percent plus some change there's some other kind of really funky uh, versions of dementia out there but 17 percent are vascular dementia. So these are people who have had kind of small strokes, ones that they didn't notice. They didn't have one-sided weakness. They didn't have verbal issues. Uh, these are people who just had small little strokes, small little step-offs in their function over the course of many, many years. And so it, these are individuals who seem to function okay. And then I go visit mom and boy, she just doesn't, doesn't seem like she was even last week. And then she hangs out there for a little while and maybe another step off. And everyone's step offs, step offs are different and how long they're at each plateau is, plateau is different. And if they continue to step off, it's different. But these folks are more likely to have issues like, the, uh, like diabetes, high blood pressure, smokers. They're more likely to get this type of dementia. Then there's a thing called Lewy body dementia which is kind of like Parkinson's disease, except you get the memory problems first, and then it presents with slowing of movement and tremor and such, like Parkinson's disease would. Um, and then you got Parkinson's disease, which after about a year or, or, or longer, you can get memory problems with it. So it's all about the time course there, but it's similar to Parkinson's. Alcoholic dementia, I think you know, I see a lot of that, um, unfortunately, in this area. And then a fancy one called frontal temporal dementia. This is usually in younger individuals who are usually in their 60s. And these people have lost the frontal lobe, so they're disinhibited. Um, they are, have no executive function. They're, uh, they, they're really difficult um, to deal with because they, they just, um, the behavior issues are, are real, real troublesome for them. And generally fairly aggressive. Uh, most of the time course for these things, uh, it's about seven, seven to ten years uh, time course from uh, onset of illness and kind of first diagnosis to, to um, uh, death for Alzheimer's type dementia. Frontal temporal, five to seven years is a bit, bit more aggressive. So clinical cues, so when should you think about this? Uh, so if patient complains of memory problems, probably worth asking about. Uh, the thing that I kind of help distinguish me, is this a real problem or is this just some aging, some slowness of thinking and recalling? Because uh, we all have those parts where you just have a mental fart and you just can't come up with something. And so it's, it's the people who can't make the memory to begin with. So it's like, you know, what did you eat for supper last night? Ah, uh, don't know. Absolutely not. Well, you had something that you grilled out. Still ain't there. Um, but when, you know, th then it's the, you know, person, oh, we grilled out, oh, yeah, you know, we had, we had hamburgers and hot dogs and stuff like that. And were they able to come, come up with, with a cue, then they can at least make the memory to begin with. Uh, if an informant has concern, most of the time it's, uh, it's usually a, an adult uh, son or daughter who has that. And then uh, if they notice any sort of drop off in their IDLs or ADLs, it's another time to kind of think about this. So as I think about it from a kind of a physician standpoint, the things I'm thinking about, so what are the risk factors for the memory problem? So alcohol use, so the head injury, uh, very rarely do I see people with heavy metal exposures, so people work in you know, some sort of a smelting factory or something. Medications, because that can present as dementia. So we, you gotta think about meds as something that's contributing to you know, the slowness of thinking. Um, and then level of education, because some folks, they're just, I mean, their baseline level of intelligence or education is just going to be um, that versus, you know, you take someone who's a high-functioning individual at baseline, and now all of a sudden they're having trouble with, you know, managing finances. Well, you know, shoot, they were running the company. You know, there's a huge step off there. Um, that, that's that's uh, something to, to bear in mind. 
uh, assess their ADLs and uh, basic ADLs. So I, I keep coming back to that, but that, that really it boils down to function, and that's why I keep coming back to that. A thorough history and physical exam and neurological assessment is something that uh, their clinician or, or provider should do. Uh, some sort of a cognitive assessment screening instrument. And then uh, some sort of laboratory thing. So about 5% of people with, who present for like a dementia evaluation will have a reversible cause. That's like a medication that's causing the issue or if it's hypothyroidism or they're anemic or whatever. So some sort of medical evaluation should probably be uh, done for this. Um, and so again, it's looking at risk factors and uh, what you want to do there. So this is, as I went through the top causes of dementia, this is what we call a differential diagnosis. So differential diagnosis is patient comes in with symptoms X, Y, and Z. What could it be? And these are just a partial list of things that it could be uh, that you need to think about then as well. So it's trying to find people who fall outside the normal the normal presentations for things like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, the, the heavy hitters, um, and, and just think about other stuff. So screening tools. So, um, so U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, USPSTF, um, is, is who I generally follow for most of my recommendations, like colon cancer screening, breast cancer screening, prostate cancer screening, and then American Academy of Neurology, uh, they don't recommend routinely screening people who are asymptomatic, so people who don't have any complaints about anything. So just your average person who walks in to see their doc, who's over 65, probably shouldn't te uh, test for them. Um, so they do recommend screening, though, if there's any sort of concern, as I mentioned before. And uh, the... The, the issue is cognitive tests should probably assess multiple of those functional domains uh, because, you know, if someone just has one functional domain, you can't say that they've got it. Again, it's about making that diagnosis of seeing it in multiple domains of their, uh, of their cognition. Testing should be quick and easy and uh, should be able to identify people even at kind of mild stages where they're first having impacts on their, on their IDLs. At the end of the day, uh, these aren't diagnostic tests. Really, the diagnostic test, it's, it's many times a clinical diagnosis, so the doc needs to make the clinical diagnosis, and it's part of looking at the whole picture of the individual. But then, even then, sometimes it's not clear, and there's diagnostic testing called neuropsychiatric or neuropsychology testing, and that takes two to four hours, um, and it's pretty intensive in each of these different domains uh, to see where people's areas of strength and weakness are. Um, so, use the screen for cognitive impairment, uh, aid with uh, determining differential, uh, these screening tools do, they help with rating severity of dementia and monitoring progression of the disease, uh, which again helps kind of figure out maybe what the underlying problem is. So there's a number of, if you go and just Google, because let's say you worry about someone having a memory problem, you're going to find all these different dementia screening tools. And what the heck one do you choose? Because that's not an easy thing. And so there's this idea of sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is if someone has a disease, how likely is this test going to be to find that disease? Okay. And specificity then is, um, you know, if, if What's, what's the chance if the test positive that we are in fact sure that this person does in fact have that disease? So you want this balance. If something's too sensitive, you're going to get kind of false positives with it. If it's not sensitive enough, then you're going to miss out on people who actually have the disease. And so I, I put this up to show you that you know, there's a wide range of sensitivities and specificities for different tests. And it's trying to find this balance of what's a reasonable test that's not going to give you too many positives or too many negatives. So the old gold standard for memory testing was what we call the MMSE, the Mini Mental Status Exam, or Mini Mental State Exam. It takes about eight minutes to perform. Um, and what has kind of started to take its place is one called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And it's very sensitive, fairly specific at 87%. Takes about 10 minutes to perform. The one I like is uh, actually not on this list. And actually, I'm sorry, it is. It's called the Minicog. And uh, that one, fairly sensitive, fairly specific, and super, super quick. Takes you know three, two, three minutes to, to, uh, to do that one. So uh, let's see. So there, you know, I, I think about things from a primary care standpoint, 
And different tests get validated different ways. Uh, some aren't validated to be done as inpatient. Some aren't validated to be done in nursing homes. Some aren't, some aren't validated to be done in the clinic. So it's trying to find ones that can work kind of everywhere. And so this is the mini mental status examination. And uh, it walks through kind of orientation questions. Where are you? What's the date? What's the time? Those sorts of things. Kind of where are you? Uh, then is the kind of the next, you know, what state are you in? What town are you in? And so it gives 10 points out of a possible 30. It gives 10 just for kind of knowing where you're at and kind of time and those sorts of things. Then it asks like a three word recall, okay? of car, vase, and brick in this particular one that you ask then at the end, um, you know, for them to recall that. Then it's got the attention task of counting backwards by seven. Uh, you ask them word again. Uh, then it's a naming task of what, you know, two items are. The uh, no ifs, ands, or buts, which is the verbal assessment of it. And then following commands, so um, again, kind of test, testing someone's kind of working memory. Writing a sentence, again, that's verbal. Uh, close your eyes, again, that's verbal. And then interlocking pentagons, which is a visual spatial. So one of the limitations of this test is it doesn't test executive function. Um, and so that's one of the limitations. The other one is uh, the person who came up with this didn't have it copy. There was no copyright out for years and years and years, and they went and got a copyright. So anytime you administer this, you should charge them. A, you should collect a dollar in royalties uh, and send it off to this individual. So. Um, that's the limitation and why we never use it. Um, but it is the gold standard. So if you look at, you know, if you're into reading research papers, um, it is the gold standard that everything previously had really been compared to. Again, test language, attention, memory, visual, spatial skills. Takes 10 minutes to administer. Uh, score 24 uh, is about 87% 87 specific and 82% sensitive for finding someone who actually has true dementia. So not too bad. Again, closer to 100 the better, uh, but there is still, you know, a chance, uh, you know, 15% chance that you're going to miss the diagnosis or uh, be incorrect and the person tests positive. Now, actually, about is there's good normative data for this, uh, so you know it it, uh, it can be used across you know, ethnicities and religion and, and across cultures, um, which makes it uh, nice in that regard. Negative, though, is, you know, uh, take Iowa City. Uh, we have a fair number of people who are professors and have attained very high levels of education. And uh, so there is some sort of a ceiling effect uh, because of high education with it. Also, a floor effect, once people get kind of severely impacted enough, they're going to score, you know, 15, 15, 15, 15, even though their, you know, act, you know, their need for assistance is getting more and more. And it's not really good at detecting like really mild dementia or like mild cognitive impairment. And like I said, it doesn't uh, test for executive function, which I frankly think is one of the most important things to really be testing for. The mini cognitive assessment, I like to use this one. I'm like, yeah, well, are you quirky or is there something wrong? And so it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's so like, yeah. So it's like a three word recall, which is simple enough. Okay, so orange, airplane, tobacco. Okay, those are the three words I have memorized. So it's that, and then you have them draw a clock. So give them a piece of paper. Here, draw a clock. Okay, circle, put the numbers, hands, 10 past 11. And then you ask them what the three words are again. And the clock is either, either right or wrong, okay? They've done, I, I, I've read more than I ever want to probably need to again on memory screening. Uh, but if you look at the clock, you're like, that clock is correct or it's not correct. That's good enough, okay? Uh, there's all these other ways to measure out a clock and doesn't seem like one is better than the other. It takes one to two minutes to do. And uh, I think this, is, this has also been validated across kind of the healthcare spectrum. So, you know, if you got people here that you're worried about, people in the hospital you're worried about, people in my clinic I'm worried about, it can work anywhere. And I think that is what makes this just an awesome tool. And so, if they get all three right, they're likely not demented. If they get all three words right, you don't even go on to the clock. If they get one to two right, you go on to the clock, right, wrong. And if it's wrong, like, you know, potentially dementia. If it's right, probably not dementia. And then uh, if they get None of the three words right, probably dementia. Again, it's visual, spatial, and memory domains. 
It's quick to administer across all healthcare settings. And I'd argue, you know, you remember if, you know, back a bit of a ways, we were looking at the sensitivity and specificity of uh, the MSE. This is uh, darn near on par with that. And so I, I think, you know, that, that gives a lot of uh, face value in my opinion. Um, it's better than identifying dementia alone from like a primary care doc who should be looking for this stuff. And so I think that has some value to it. Uh, very mild dementia, it's good at finding that. It wasn't stressful. Patients didn't feel like they were on, like the test anxiety uh, with it. It's not limited by subjects education or language because you can do a three word recall in any language. Most clocks are universal. Um, it's not appropriate, obviously, for aphasic patients or people who can't talk. People are real hard of hearing. Obviously, you want to be, you know, uh, cognizant of that. Uh, but it really, the, the trouble with this is that it may not necessarily aid in differentiating the, the type of dementia, but in many respects, you know, we just want to see if there's a problem, right? I mean, that's what we're looking for. And send them up the, up the chain for more testing. And then the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. So, um, as you can see, it's far more complex uh, than, than the other tests. So it has a, uh, an executive function kind of component where they're having uh, this alternating one to A and two to B and B to C, or B to three and three to C kind of thing. So it's alternating uh, connect the dots of letters and numbers. Instead of a simple 2D, it's a 3D image that they need to do. Clock draw, word recall, or sorry, uh, animal naming. Uh, which uh, is uh, animals that aren't commonly come across. I, I don't know how they pick those, but then the, this one is also designed in uh, other languages, so they look at other areas of the world, and you find animals that aren't common to that area of the world, so I don't know what, like an armadillo maybe isn't common in one area of the world, so that might be what they have there. So they do have, try to tailor this to the different languages of the world. I think it's in like 70 different languages. It's a five-word recall instead of a three-word recall, which is what the other two tests were. Uh, it's got a digit kind of section, uh, which is a tension task. Then it has this one called the go-no-go no go test, and that's where it's, uh, you give people a series of letters and they have to tap or so, some sort of indication whenever you say the letter A. Again, a good attention task. And then the, serial, the, the counting down from 100 by, by 7, uh, another thing there. The st syntactically complex sentence, uh, so I only know that John is the one to help today, is the well, example of one of those. Um, and it's a lot more difficult than you know repeating no ifs, ands, or buts back to an individual. So it's, it's more, more complicated than that. Um, I don't know why they choose the letter F, um, but they want, it, want you to give them 11 words to begin with letter F. Um, and I've never gotten the big one. And I've done this for many years, which is interesting. <laughs> um, so abstraction then. So um, banana and orange, how are those related? They're both fruit. Uh, and then train bicycle. So it's, you know, helping, you know, kind of get that reasoning. Again, another measure of executive function. Delayed recall then. So they come back now and you got to get five words. What's interesting is a clinician is, you know, for these folks who can't, who don't get, get it just by, hey, what were those five words I asked you, okay? You give them clues, so categorical clues. So you say, you know, one was a type of, of fabric, okay, velvet. And what's interesting is once they, if they get them with categorical cues, that tells you they're, they're able to make the memory. So what up here in attention or what, what's going on medically with that individual that they're able to make the memory but they're not able to recall it? And so, as, and then, then at the end, uh, orientation. And uh, as you can see, this is a bear. I honestly, I think I'd get like a 24 on this out of 30. It, it's, it's really tough. It's really tough. Um, but it's, it's designed um, to really find mild cognitive impairment. So people, before they develop dementia, before they start having impacts on their IDLs, it evaluates all the domains, so executive, attention, verbal, so forth, and it's very sensitive. Apparently, with uh, mild cognitive impairment, it'll get up to 90%. And it's fairly specific then, too, um, compared to the MMSC. And the test, retest reliability, so if, you, if I give you the test today and I give it to you in a week or two or three, that, it's that you're going to test consistently throughout, 
so it has good validity in that way and good value. So you could follow people over, uh, with time. And so I view this as, you know, this is probably in my, in my clinic, in our clinic, the geriatric clinic at the university, uh, this is what we routinely do for people, when they, you know, any patient who comes in to see us to establish care at the geriatric clinic. But if they've got any sort of memory problems where they're, you know, yeah, they see me functioning okay, this is the test we give them. Uh, if someone comes in, it's obvious they have dementia. I mean, you know, they can't give me any semblance of any sort of history. They can't tell me why they're there. I think, I think you're going to just embarrass them by giving them this sort of test. And I think it just, uh, it, you just, patients won't ever forget getting this test if they've got really profound dementia. I guarantee it. They're, and they're not going to want to come back and see me. So it needs to be used kind of, I don't want to say judiciously, but carefully. Um, yeah, and it's been validated in Australia and Korea and Europe and all over the place. It's really, in, in the literature, it's really the go-to now for memory screening. This was called the receiver operator curve. It's just a fancy way of graphing sensitivity versus specificity. And the more up to the high left you are, the more sensitive it is and the more specific it is for what you're looking for. And the light blue line is the is the MOCA, the test that just went over, MSE, and then just a flip of a coin. And so obviously down here, that's uh, obviously not where you want to live. Um, and so it's, it's a better test, an all-around better test. Other things, so as you think about dementia, you want to make sure you're not missing other things. Depression will present, can present as, as dementia. Delirium can present as dementia. Um, and so you want to do ADL assessment. Like I said, I keep hammering home on that. Function, function, function. So where are they functioning? And then doing some sort of a depression scale. So I like the geriatric depression scale. The reason I, so there's a term in psychiatry for people with like uh, schizophrenia. I call these things like negative symptoms. And negative symptoms are people who are, you know, they're more withdrawn, they're quiet. It's not the schizophrenic individual who's out on the street who's causing all kinds of trouble. They're, they're very internal. And with older adults, we see their dementia doesn't present usually as tearfulness and I want to kill myself. I mean, it, it's different. It's very much internal. It's very much feeling hopeless. Um, it's very much just uh, being down and low energy. And so this does a better job of screening for that than what we t traditionally think of as like the PHQ-9. So that's a good screen for the general population. But the older adults, this does a better job for finding it because of those kind of, I, again, I say it's more negative symptoms of, of dementia. Or sorry, of depression, sorry. Too many Ds here. It could be, uh, could be from being like, being forced to maybe put be someplace in, in, you know, wanting to be there. I've seen that happen many times. Certainly. You know, they get taken out of, you know, the family just takes them out of their home and, and they don't feel like, you know, they want to, don't want to be there, you know, they want to be back in their home. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they feel, you know, they feel very withdrawn and, you know, it could, you know, it's just, you know, it's very, you know, could be depression and everything, and yep. you know, everything just kind of leads to, leads to other things. Yep, and it may not present as I'm feeling down, right. blue, and depressed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The other thing then is uh, delirium. So, uh, you know, uh, delirium, the big thing about that is this waxing and waning of their cognition. And so attention seems to be the major issue there. Uh, you know, people are, uh, you know, picking at flies, uh, you know, seeing things on their gown. Um, but it may just be that they're presenting with this waxing and waning memory problem. And uh, delirium can last, you know, I had, I had one guy, uh, you know, I, I, I made the mistake of diagnosing him with the, uh, dementia because he'd been tested for it and he showed signs of dementia. He had MRI consistent with dementia. Three to four months, memory problems. He started when he was in the hospital felt it was dementia. All it was was delirium. And he had been out of the hospital from pneumonia for three months. And so it's, you know, it's a waxing and waning component. And so doing some sort of delirium screen and being having a very low index of suspicion for delirium is extremely important. So uh, the CAM-ICU is what we do. 
Um, and uh, and not, not for all, every patient, again, this is by clinical course, but uh, someone's been acutely ill or there's been an abrupt change with how they're functioning, there seems to be a waxing, waning component to it, uh, delirium may likely be the case. So diagnosis and other considerations. So history and mental status examination lead to the diagnosis. Um, history and screening tool with inconsistencies, then recommend further evaluation. So think you need to assess their current living situation, how much support they're needing, how much, you know, do they do they have enough support? I think here in a place like Oak Knoll, you know, it's it's are they in the right level of care? You know, if you identify the person in independent, why are you identifying that? and do they need to be in a different level. Neuropsychological evaluation, uh, if the diagnosis is not for certain. And then neuroimaging, uh, really don't order this too often. If someone depends, you know, really it depends on how it's presenting and, and, and what the overarching symptoms are. Um, low yield, again, less than 5% of the time do we find someone with a, you know, a Goomba in the brain or something like that. Many times it is helpful though, it might differentiate someone from having a vascular dementia from an Alzheimer's type dementia, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm gonna be treating someone's blood pressure and diabetes regardless. Um, so, but it, it, it can help with giving prognosis. Um, and then uh, clinical dementia rating scale, again, getting an idea of how severe it is. But again, I think you can follow this by how people are functioning. So harms for screening, uh, just to be the bearer of bad news, uh, it doesn't change long-term outcomes. We, we don't have a way to prevent it. I mean, people with Alzheimer's type dementia, we don't have a way to prevent depression. I don't care what medications they take, an Aricept or a Mender or whatever, those don't change the clinical course for these individuals. The increased risk for depression, anxiety, imagine being diagnosed with dementia, you know, and how that's gonna hit you. Timing and cost of screening, I think that's pretty low, but either way. Uh, you know, if people need diagnostic neuropsychiatric uh, testing, uh, and that can be very anxiety inducing. I mean, that's a two to three hour, four hour test on someone who knows you're testing their cognition. Imagine the stress surrounding that. And again, no effective treatment for MCI in most forms of dementia. May, may uh, so if you get the diagnosis of dementia, you know, 68, may not be able to get long-term care insurance, may not be able to buy into a place like Oatmeal because of it. Side effects of medical treatment, so you, end up, you know, people always want to try treatment even though it may not work, so side effects of treatment are very real um, and many of the medicines that we use to treat people with Alzheimer's disease and other things cause a lot of abdominal discomfort and weight loss, you know, things that we're already battling against <coughs> to begin with. Uh, again, medicines to alter the course of disease, economic burden, um, and then community resources. So you screen for people, but then you got nothing to offer, offer them. Um, it's something to think about. So the benefits of screening, though, I, I think one of the fundamental reasons to screen for is you give them an explanation for maybe what's going on, and it buys them time to manage their, you know, plan their estate, plan who their durable power of attorney is for financial and health care issues. Um, and uh, you know, long-term care, driving. How are you going to, you know, navigate these things? What's the long-term living situation? Um, it might delay uh, the institutionalization of people because you're able to kind of, kind of rally around someone. Family's able to make kind of maybe some major life choices themselves to maybe kind of remove themselves from the workforce mm -hmm. and start taking care of their loved one. Improve quality of life because now they have an explanation for maybe why you know their loved one has changed. You know maybe they've had a huge personality change and it's not it's not that you know you it's, it's the disease. Uh, pharmacologic interventions, but again I'm not overly sold on them. Um, and uh, again, but no high quality evidence seems to show that you know screening and finding this really helps alter the course for too many people. So in summary, these are kind of things I went through. Uh, here, and uh, if you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them. So, we're out of time too. so questions. So, this is the fun part. Uh, you get to kind of screen each other, and uh, so on the back of your packets is a Montreal Cognitive Assessment. 
And I, I give this to you guys. So I was there as a fellow learning how to become a geriatrician. And at a, one of my uh, psychology uh, folks in the department was just observing me to see how I went about working with my patients, give me feedback. So I did a dementia screen. And, and uh, what, I, what I didn't know I was doing was I was, uh, when they got something wrong, I, I was, without knowing, kind of giving a little bit of a saddy frown face. I didn't know it. You know, I got that feedback. And so when you give these sort of tests, we suspect this sort of thing, um, you know, not giving feedback to people and being kind of straight-faced about it. So um, give it a try. It takes about 10 minutes. And that concludes my, my part. So I don't think everybody has a question if you guys can share. Just go in there anyway, so. Please. But before I start, any, any questions or... You don't have to participate in this part if you don't want to, or, or you're worried about something. <laughs>